I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. Today I'm joined by a consummate adventure, entrepreneur and outdoorsman, the star of the Hunt the Wild series and owner of Argali, Brad Brooks. Brad, welcome to the Silver Core Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Well, I'm really excited to be speaking with you. I've been following what you do. I've been consuming some of your, your media that you have out there. You're doing a fantastic job with that. And I really want to thank you for making the time today. I know we were scheduled for another time, but you had a, uh, what is it? A 3d archery convention or is it a tournament? Uh, it's just a, yeah, just a, uh, uh, 3d archery event. Uh, I'm not really sure what the proper nomenclature is, but this is, this is also, yeah, I, uh, we had a bit of a scheduling snafu and I, I leave earlier tomorrow to head to that. And I've just got, this is like just a busy time of year for us and for me. And so, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad we could find time together to chat because if, if it didn't happen today, it might be a while before we can make something happen. I agree. I mean, it's yeah, busy schedules. Anyways, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So I've been watching the hunt the wild series. You're doing a fantastic job with that. How long have you been doing that for? You know, uh, well, so we, uh, Argali was started, uh, probably about, you know, not that long ago, like five years ago. And we were a, a content company when we started. And, but in the, you know, our origin story is, is fairly boring in some ways. It was me and my business partner, uh, having a beer and complaining about hunting media. Um, not that they're, there wasn't and isn't a lot of great stuff out there, but there was a lot of stuff that we just personally couldn't relate to. And, you know, growing up in, uh, Idaho, anybody who's familiar with Idaho, Idaho has, you know, uh, you know, like we're the second, uh, state in the lower 48 in terms of the amount of like unroaded country we have. So wilderness and roadless land. So I grew up around big wild country it was just, you know, kind of what we did, right? Like you would go out into the wilderness and go hunting or go hiking. Um, and for me, place, like specific places were always really integral and important to me, uh, for hunting. So there were places that I just look forward to going, you know, we, uh, every single fall and we weren't, we hunted, uh, growing up, you know, my dad is from the uh, Midwest in the U S here. And so he was a whitetail hunter very right. different style of hunting than like we do in the West here. But so we would go on one hunt a year, big game hunt a year. And, uh, as kids and we would hunt waterfowl and upland birds. And like, that was, um, for our hunting. And, uh, that was kind of what we did. And I always look forward to our big game hunt because we would go back to a place that just had this, um, uh, had some sort of, um, I don't know, place in my, my heart. (laughs) I just wanted to go back there as much as I could. I can feel that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think most hunters have that place. It might be your farm. It might be a a river. It might be a giant wilderness area, whatever it is. Like I would say that anybody who hunts or fishes, um, and it's not just people that hunt and hunt or fish. I think people in general have places that they're drawn to, but hunters and hunters and anglers in particular have places they're drawn to. And so we, we wanted to start a company that was looking at hunting, not through the lens of look at me and look how, look at this big shit I've killed, um, right. which as a, as again, as a consumer of media, like I don't care about that. I care about, um, I wanted to see hunting media that was trying to tell a story about something interesting. And that might be a person or a place. And for us, because of that central role of place in our, in, uh, uh, in hunting for us, we wanted to tell stories that were putting people in place up front and where sort of, you know, like, uh, I'd say the other parts of that hunting content. So like the kill shots and the things that you traditionally associate with, I would say old school mm-hmm. hunting media, those sort of took a back seat in the story we were trying to tell. Um, so that's how we, uh, got our start. And at some point, 
we had made a couple of uh, a couple of films, and uh, in each of those films, if you watch them, you know conservation and the value of wild country sort of is is sort of woven throughout the story. Yes. Um, but uh, you know, the idea for doing the Last Wild Place series uh, uh, really came from me wanting to just like drive home with a a giant hammer <laughs> to people that you know. <laughs> Wild country is important. It is a scarce resource and we are mm-hmm. not making any more of it. It is, you know, I guarantee you, Travis, like by the time you and I are, you know, if we're lucky enough to be, to live to an old age, there mm-hmm. will not be more wild country than there is today. Uh, yes. More than likely there will be less. That's just the way human, human, you know, civilization and progress is moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not someone who like laments it or is angry about it. But I do think it's important uh, a little bit, but um, I don't get bitter about it. But I would say that I think it's important. And that's why we started the series to help hunters recognize like, hey, this this is a scarce resource. What you got right now in front of you and it doesn't exist by accident like this. You, we can choose to keep these places the way they are. Mm. And I think most people. Uh, are drawn to the allure of big wild country in some way. Maybe not jumping right into it if you've never been in it before, but the idea of it, the idea of big wild country, the idea that it exists, like that is something that most people can connect with. I don't care, you know, how you vote or how you identify politically. That's important. It's important to me. It's important to wildlife and it's important to all of us as hunters to our, our past and the loss of wild country to me is a travesty. <laughs> I, um, so anyways, I'll, I'll stop by saying like, uh, I think, you know, if, if we can no longer get lost in wild country as, as humans, that's a, that's a sad day. We should have places to go get lost in. And so our last wild places series was really meant for, you know, to, to highlight some of what we consider to be the last big wild places left in the lower 48. And that was sort of how it all, um, how it all started. So you, you're just sitting around having some beers and you said, w- was it that fleshed out at the very beginning of no, the objective? No, no, hell, hell no, hell okay. no, 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 no. So, I mean, the, the, the last wild places came a couple of years later, but the, the, uh, the, the beers really just led to, uh, sorry, I kind of glossed over that. Um, the beers yeah. really just led to, you know, it was just two guys complaining about things as, as, you know, as we are wont to do sometimes. And that, you know, we said, well, let's, why don't we tell a story? Why don't we make a film? And my business partner, who actually has talent as a filmmaker, he is a filmmaker. And he actually has talent. <laughs> um, you know, we, you know, by the end of it, you know, and you know, I don't know how many how many beers we had, but it was more more probably than we should have. And it was like, it was all enough. right, let's do it. And if and people who know me know that, like, if I say I'm going to do something, I don't wake up the next day and say like oh, I shouldn't have done that. I I wake up the next day saying I committed to do that. Let's do it. And it's so <laughs> just. Well, I'm wired, I guess, but yeah. so we, we, uh, you know, literally I woke up the next day, I called Jason and I said, I meant what I said last night. And I said, are you in or not? And he's like, I'm in. And that was it. So that was kind of how we, um, how we sort of got, uh, started. And then it was, there was no business plan. There was no business. It was just, we wanted to tell this one story and that was uh, chasing Ridgelines, uh, film we made about my brother and I, and that was a good at, film. Oh, th- thank you. I, it's hard to look back sometimes on like content you've made and just like pick it, you, you pick it apart as a con content oh, yeah. creator, but, um, it, everyone's their own worst critic, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. It's a healthy thing in some ways, but, um, and, but anyways, after that, there was no, there was no business. There was no plan. It was just, we want to tell that story after we made that, um, there was interest from some of the companies we had worked with, um, to do another one. So we did another one. And at some point along the way, it was like, ah, maybe there's something here. Um, my, my, you know, we didn't, I didn't start creating content because I wanted recognition or I wanted gear or any of that. Like this wasn't, right. this was, you know, I, I had a job. I, I didn't need, I, I could pay for my own gear. Like I wasn't, I wasn't looking, I wasn't trying to, I didn't care if anybody, what they thought of my hunting abilities or anything like that. Um, what, what was your job? Uh, I worked in, you know, uh, public and environmental policy. Right. And, yeah. And- so, don't you have a background in, you've got a master's in business, don't you? Yeah, uh, MBA and then background in uh, um, environmental economics. Right. 
Yeah. It's really kind of boring. <laughs> a lot of math and, and well, you, you sure turned it into something that isn't boring. You know, yeah, I, true. I, I find it, um, I find it interesting. Uh, the number of times that people will go to the pub and they'll have a few beers or they got friends yeah. over and all the grand ideas that everybody has. And the next day they just, they're gone. And yeah. I remember at an early age, I'd go out to the pub and I'd bring a little notebook with me, a little pencil and paper, or if I was really fancy, I'd bring a Palm Pilot that uh, a friend of mine, his dad gave me. <laughs> you're, dating, you're dating yourself now. Uh, I know. <laughs> bring up my Palm Pilot. <laughs> but people would be talking about these different ideas and all of a sudden somebody would say something like, that sounds like a good idea. And I'd ask him, I'd say, are you going to do anything with that? Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. Probably. I don't know. Do you mind if I do something with that? Whatever. Knock yourself out. Boop write it into the thing. Great. No hard feelings. And the, the next day I'd start per pursuing it. And there was so many different avenues that I pursued. Some of them took off and some didn't, but at an early age, realizing that there is a great separator between the dreamers and the people who will actually take that next step. Cause everybody's got ideas and dreams, but not everybody has a courage to take that next step like you've done. And it's really paid off for you. It looks like anyways, from yeah. an outsider looking in. <laughs> it, it has. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, you just like touched on something that, uh, I have, I have come to appreciate and understand, which is that everybody's got ideas. And I used to be so, uh, I'd say early on, and I, I have had plenty of failures that there are other, I mean, our golly was not, uh, originally intended to be what it is today. It was intended mm. to be a, a hunting clothing company in 2010. Oh, um, really? Yeah. I, I dreamt up the, uh, the, the brand and the name was in 2010. And it was before First Sight existed. Uh, Sitka existed, but Kuyu didn't. Um, mm. There really wasn't a technical hunting clothing company that I was aware of other than Sitka. And the idea for Argali, which it's funny in hindsight because it's not that, it doesn't sound novel today, but it was to create a hunting gear company and really lean into the merino wool uh, really mm. hard as a, um, a product line. But I was, you know, I was 25, I, don't, I didn't have any money. Uh, right. I had ideas. I hustled, I hustled, you know, like crazy to try and make it happen, almost made it happen, but it floundered. Um, mm. but I learned a lot from it, but I think what you just said, like rings true. It's like, I used to be very protective of my ideas because I thought, ah, people are going to steal them. And mm. there's some truth to that. Right. But oh, for the most is. part, oh, go when, ahead, when you really start to succeed, there, there's truth to that because you've already paved the way. But when yeah. the idea is, is there as an idea form. Uh, it seems to be in a pretty safe space because most people actually won't follow up and do anything with it until you've actually yeah. dragged the ball the majority of the way across the field. I, that is 100% true. Like having the, uh, like it, it seems so simple and yet m most people, they either are intimidated by it. It's too much time. Uh, there, there's a lot of reasons, like legitimate reasons, like other priorities. Mm. But I think the way that, I'm wired and I think you're, it sounds like you're wired, Travis is like, you know, tr you know, seeing something through to its logical conclusion is, uh, something that I have learned sort of separates entrepreneurs from, from mm -hmm. non entrepreneurs. And I don't really call myself an entrepreneur, but like being able to like see something through and know, like, this is a dead end or this is actually, there's some legs here. That's sort mm -hmm. of the difference between, uh, a lot of, a lot of folks. And then I think folks that are, uh, start businesses, um, and are able to kind of like scrap it together and make it work. Mm. Um, and it's not to say that it's, it's a bad thing to not necessarily like follow up on ideas, but I can't, yeah, like you and me, it's like, I can't tell you how many good ideas I've heard from other people. I'm like, you should do something with that. There, totally. That's a good business. You could, you could make a lot of money with that. It might be, you know a five to 10 year process <laughs> to pull it out, but <laughs> that's a retirement idea. You could retire off that one. Um, yeah. But anyways, it's just like, most people aren't interested in doing it. It's like the Beatles. How come they had so many good hits? <laughs> they, they had so many bad ones as well. And yeah. they just tried and tried and they saw which ones worked and some will take off and some won't. But the, yeah, the, um. But not being afraid. I think you said something too. It's like, you can't be afraid of, of falling flat on your face. And yeah. I, I mean, I've started, you know, websites that, uh, I worked on for a few months and I'm just like, ah, I'm going to abandon this. And I can mm. remember, you know, taking crap from some of my buddies. They're like, Oh my God, you know, making fun of me for doing, it. I'm like, I didn't care. 
You know, you just right. have to like, you, you can't. Know, be able, no, 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 no. But just like being okay with just like trying different things. And eventually, you know, for anybody out there who's interested in starting a business, it's like your first thing may not work out. Your second thing may not work out. But if you're willing to keep trying things and you're not afraid of like the, the frustration that comes along with failure, um, and trust your instincts, I, I would guarantee eventually, like you're going to, you're going to have a good idea. That's going to, that's going to stick because mm-hmm. everybody can, anybody can have a good idea, you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of people do have good ideas. Well, you know, I, one other thing that I find, and I don't know if this is uh, a shared thing amongst other entrepreneurs, but, uh, whatever that idea is, you can make it happen. Whether you turn around and look back afterwards and say, was it worth it? Maybe, or maybe not. The after some time I found the really smart ones are able to identify, wait, this is not the best direction to be going in. Let's pivot and take a better direction. But no matter what your idea is, if you're, you're whatever it is, selling little widgets, you can make it work. It might be a lot of work. It might be every hour of the day, but you can make it work. You might look back and say, man, there's much easier things I could have done. And I think that's where a lot of people, uh, fail is because they don't see, they don't see it working or they don't see that instant success out of it. Or maybe they're yeah. smart and they are not as pig headed <laughs> and they say, you know, I think it would be a lot better for me to do this other thing, just work for somebody else and I'll make as much or more money. But I don't know if they'd have the same satisfaction. Yeah. I don't know either. I think, you know, one thing I've noticed in my like pure group of business people, um, they tend to be a very stubborn group. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I am a stubborn person for sure. And, <laughs> um, I just think, you know, not, not taking, you know, no for an answer or taking, you know, every challenge is, as just like, I'm not going to not accepting what's given to you. is just like a common thread, um, that right. I see. Uh, it's, it's both a, a, a blessing and a curse for, uh, those people that I know who are my friends of mine who fit that <laughs> bill. So. Well, there's always a solution. We might not see it yet. If we've tried everything, keep trying because yeah. you haven't found that solution yet. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, just to bring that home, I mean, think about this, our golly, I thought of it in 2010, I failed at starting a clothing company, mm-hmm. um, for a variety of reasons, which I won't even get into, but there was a five year lull where I tried other things, not, not our golly, but I was like poking around at different things and I, none of them really came to fruition, like none mm-hmm. of them. Um, and it wasn't that, uh, I wasn't really trying seriously. Like I had, I was just like doing things I was interested in, um, mm-hmm. hunting and, and rock climbing are kind of the two things I'm interested in. So I was trying some things out in the climbing world. Um, and none of it, none of it real seriously, but there wasn't, there was a five year gap in there before I felt like there was something worth doing that actually had legs. Um, yeah. And you know, Again, every day I question whether or not this is actually going to work out. So it's a, it's a, it's a daily struggle. It's, it's still an ongoing process. So are you a trad climber, sport climber? Everything. Yeah. Everything? I, I think my, my preferred style, I, I love Alpine, just Alpine rock yes. climbing. Um, but, uh, spent a lot of time, uh, sport climbing. I've traveled internationally to sport climb, um, and do a lot of that here locally and, I think before I had kids, I did a lot more traveling and alpine climbing all over the place. And we have a lot of great alpine climbing here too, but, um, a little bit of everything I do. And in the winter, I boulder a lot for, uh, just strength and strength training, but yeah. Keeps you fit for hunting season. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 It's a nice balance to hunting too. You know, I get, I get uh, bored easily and I, I love hunting, but it's nice to have a break. Um, a balance in, in life for me is really important. So not just with my own personal interest, but family, you know, business mm. is a break from hunting. Um, you know, the thing, the thing that nobody tells you about starting a, a business in the hunting industry is that like, you know, your customers, uh, want things during hunting season, which means that you have to think about <laughs> their, their needs. That's, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's your season shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, that balance that you're talking about, that can be incredibly difficult. And I know some entrepreneurs, some driven people will have a very difficult time changing gears, whether it's work, 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 or family, 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 and try and how do you manage that balance? Uh, I, I think 
poorly and it's a constant <laughs> struggle. Like if I'm being honest, like I, mm-hmm. uh, I shouldn't say poorly. Like I, I, I try really hard to find that balance, but you know, it's like, if there's, if this is the balance point right here, you know, it's like, I'm constantly kind of going back and forth and right. <laughs> I'm always trying to find the middle, but it's like this invisible middle that I never know if I'm, if I'm on the right spot. Um, uh, I'd say the, the thing that, I have with, you know, going with my wife is we just have a really honest, candid, transparent relationship. So she feels Mm. like I'm, I'm too far, uh, on the, on one side of that scale. She's going to tell me, um, she'll be very direct about it. Like you're working too much. You need to, we need Mm. to do something in the family. It's like, you're right. I, we do. (laughs) So so important it, it is. And I, without that, like this, our, my whole situation wouldn't work very well. Cause I, I don't need somebody to, uh, tell me to go to work. I wake up early in the morning and I'm excited to do it. Just like a lot right. of people who love what they do. And you know, it's, uh, eight 45. I'm, I'm going to work till probably midnight tonight. Not, not because mm-hmm. that's why every day, but because like there's some things to do and I'm going for a work trip tomorrow. Um, but you know, this last weekend I spent, you know, the last couple weekends, uh, camp with and hanging out with the family and the kids mm. and going up, you know, not doing, not doing anything, uh, uh, that I would be doing if I, if I had my like choice of doing something active. Right. But just going out and hanging right. out with the family, taking the kids fishing. Um, and, uh, anyways, just doing, you know, fun family stuff. So I try and, and spend when I'm not, when I'm not traveling, when I'm not hunting, being present mm. with my family. And then also, scheduling things out with uh, my wife so uh you know we're going we went to hawaii this year we're going next year uh, beautiful <laughs> we're, which island uh we went to maui last year and okay. we're gonna go to maui again because we had so much fun nice yeah yeah i've, I've always spent I, I did maui once but it was uh Kauai. spent a fair bit of time on uh, Kauai and north shore oahu I've oh always, okay uh, even though Oahu's can be a bit busier, get on the North Shore and quite enjoy it over there. But, nice. Were you uh, hunting or just surfing or hanging surfing, out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Surfing. Yeah. Actually, um, I remember uh, a seat sale came up one time and a friend calls up and he says, there's, there's a fantastic seat sale. It was, I forget how much it was. I, I know the grand total was $500. $500 covered the flight there and back. And this was uh, to Kauai and we short, surfed Hanalei. And well, we surfed all over, but spent the most of the time in Honolulu. Uh, it covered the, uh, between the two of us, uh, my half of the vehicle rental, my half of accommodations, which was a vehicle. We just slept inside a van, <laughs> uh, my, my surfboard rental and my food. It was just under $500. And, uh, of course we didn't have much money and that was really appealing. And, but I said, no, I, I, I can't go. And, uh, cause my daughter was just born. She's about a, a week old. And my wife says, there's nothing you can do for her right now. Why don't you go? You're not going to get this opportunity again. Go, which um, bless her. Thank you very much. But, uh, ended up spending a week in, uh, in Kauai for just under 500 bucks surfing. And, um, I haven't seen a seat sale like that come up again. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty, that's a pretty cheap Hawaiian vacation. <sighs> yeah. Well, when you're eating like ramen noodles and, yeah. and then sleeping in the back of a minivan, it sure helps cut costs as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, like personally for me, and I, it sounds like you're probably the same way, Travis, is that the hunting, climbing and, and other things are really like important for my, for me to be me and me to be present and be a good dad, a good partner. And, mm. um, I, I envy people who don't, really need that that can just be present all the time without doing things or having you know in some ways it's like man it sounds really nice um but it's just it it is just not it's just not who i am and i've come to terms with that and uh so if i if i get restless really easily um i I never envision myself getting married or having kids as a Mm. uh, in my in my 20s and then i met my wife and she's fantastic and changed changed everything and she's yes. phenomenal and I wouldn't trade it for the world. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, man. It's like finding that balance between doing the things that are really important to you, pursuing your dreams as a person, as a human, but also being a good dad and a good partner mm-hmm. or husband or, or, or wife, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't pretend to have it figured out. And, 
uh, I'm always trying to do everything. And I think just being totally candid, it's, it's a challenge and, you know, uh, don't, don't necessarily do a hundred percent, uh, great, you know, a great job all the time, but, uh, try and, you know, try and find that balance all the time. As long as they're trying, that's all we can do. Like, <laughs> so you, you've got two, two kids now, right? I do. Yeah. Two girls. Two girls. And I, re I remember watching in one of your series there and you're talking about wanting to uh, take them out hunting. And I think yeah. uh, it was a couple years ago. Are they of an age where they've been able to come out hunting with you yet? So my, my oldest daughter is about six years old and she's been out turkey hunting with me twice. Nice. Uh, yeah. So, um, which has been f fun. It's kind of a nice like intro to hunting. I feel mm -hmm. like turkey hunting can be fairly pedestrian because you get it. You, mm -hmm. can, you can sleep in and go out. And you can get some, you can call birds in and they can, you know, see a bird gobbling their brains off. I don't know. I don't know if you guys it keeps do it much. fun. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah. Um, although this last year, my oldest daughter, we called in a Tom who was just gobbling his brains off about 20 yards out from the blind. We were, my brother and I were taking his daughter out who's, who can't hunt. And my daughter was just along for the ride and she just slept through the whole thing. Just a Tom like gobbling <laughs> out, <laughs> just strutting and gobbling right out in front yeah. of us. And she's just like, she's cold asleep in the, <laughs> so I'm like, well, this uh, is like, I, I wanted to come show you this. I was more excited than she was. And we oh, get out there me. and she's just like, eh, I'd rather, I should out. Oh, she's just excited to be out there with you. I mean, the whole oh, hunting yeah, and everything totally. else is, you know, when, uh, before having kids, I said, you know, I've made the commitment, going to have kids. And essentially uh, I've made the commitment that my life is now second place. Essentially all the things yeah. I want to do are now second place and first priority is going to be kids and family. And I think in some ways that's, uh, it's got merit, but what you're saying earlier about essentially being able to identify what defines you and not losing that piece. Now, if you're just living for the kids and the family, but you're not getting out in the rock and you're not getting out into the mountain and you're not doing these things that keep you present, then you're not giving your best to your family. And it's sort of a disservice. So I, I really like how you frame that one. Um, it feels, uh, at times, I think the, the, my, for me, it feels as though you, you could call it being selfish in some ways too. And it's really, I think it's a uh, healthy for me anyway, it's healthy to to be like always checking yourself. Like, are you, you know, are you doing what's best for your kids? Um, or is this, is this something you really need to do? Or is this just you being selfish and making excuses mm. so you can go do the things you want to do? Um, <laughs> and I, 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 you know, again, it's like, I don't, I don't know what the reality is in that situation. Be, and I don't, I don't think there's ever going to be, a, there's never an answer to that question. Um, but it's uh, for me, Answer, asking the question of myself is important because mm -hmm. it makes me wrestle with it. And sometimes I'm like, you know, you don't need to go do that. Like, you know, what's more important right now is like, you need to hang out, you know, your kids are having, a, your daughter's having a hard time. Not, you're not going to do the thing you were going to, you're planning to do, mm -hmm. or you need to cancel that meeting because there's something going on. Right. Like, so it, it helps keep it in check. And I just think questioning your motives and why you're doing something is just a healthy way to try and find that balance. Well, something else, something else that you brought up was a uh, schedule and you said, uh, scheduling things inappropriately, scheduling time with the family scheduling. That was one thing that, you know, people ask you, they say, oh, it must be nice. You've, you've got your own business and uh, you can, they'll joke. You can take any day off you want, but the reality is, is you tend to work all the time. And even when you're not working in the business, you're thinking about the business or working on the business. And I found that scheduling your time and being very diligent with that is, uh, it took me a while to figure that one out, but it's such an important piece of the puzzle. Is that the same with you? Oh man. Yeah. My schedule, I live and die by my schedule. Um, yeah. I mean, if, like I said, I mean, when you work, when you work for somebody else, uh, you might love your job, but you could set that down and walk mm. away. And there are other people that will fill in the slack. I think when it's your company, you, it's your baby, uh, not working all the time or a lot to make it succeed is just not in the cards. It's, mm -hmm. it is your thing. 
and it lives or dies by the things that you do. So, um, and if you're somebody who wants to see your thing succeed, uh, or your paycheck is dependent upon it, um, it's really hard to just turn it off. I have mm-hmm. a hard time turning it off uh, for that reason. And so, like, yes, being scheduled is incredibly important. Um, I schedule my time sometime in 15 minute increments. <laughs> right. To, yeah. It's like if I yeah, want to get, yeah, six, seven things done in a, you know, a two hour period, I will block out 15 minute increments. Like I would go to bed tonight for things I want to do tomorrow before 7 a.m. I'm going to schedule each one of them out mm-hmm. and make sure I get all of them done. Um, and it's a way that it helps bring some like peace to my life. Cause I'm like, okay, I can, I can not think about that now because I'm going to deal with it tomorrow. Mm. Um, and it also brings structure and allows me to do other things that aren't work. You know, a, a fellow that I was speaking with recently on a podcast and afterwards he, uh, he says, you know, he's, uh, he's in his, uh, mid twenties, younger, uh, early to mid twenties. And he says, I'm a project manager right now, but I'm young enough I'd really like to run my own business. And this guy's an avid outdoorsman and he's uh, very passionate about hunting. And, um, I don't find what, I don't find his desire, uh, unusual. I find a lot of other people, they say the same thing. Hey, it looks really neat. I'd really like to, uh, to start my own thing. I asked him what he wanted to do. He's like, I don't know yet, but I just, I have the desire right now. I don't know what it is, what I want to do yet. What advice would you give to somebody like that? Because I, I have a feeling he would want to do something in the outdoor world or in the hunting world. Cause that's where he's got such a big passion for it. Mm. I would say, uh, yeah, try things like just try stuff out, dip a yeah. toe in the water, um, uh, and go with what you know too. Um, I think it's, it's hard to start a business, uh, if you don't if it's something that's outside of your, your knowledge base or area of expertise, everybody has some area of expertise. Uh, they have something that they know a lot about. It might be Mm. card games. I'm just making stuff up here, Yeah, you know, but like everybody has something or can have something that they, they have sort of a, a unique set, uh, knowledge set around that they can, they can figure out how to like craft a business around. Um, Mm. may not be a good business, but, they can craft sure. a business around, right? Like, yeah. um, and you know, something that you know about and feel as though you can, uh, contribute some knowledge to the world around that's, that is unique. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's your best chance for success. If you try and like create a, if I were to go out, let's just use myself and I was going to go out and create like a, uh, Travis, like a, something maybe that you do is like, I'm going to create a, a tactical defense training course, something <laughs> I don't know anything about. Sure. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd have a very successful business because I would try to be like learning and then like teaching the things I'm learning to other people. Whereas Mm -hmm. like, you know, hunting and hunting gear, I, you know, for better or for worse, I know a lot about that. Mm. Um, and I think a lot about it. (laughs) So, um, that is, you know, it's sort of like our, my unique value proposition as a business. Right. And so if, if, uh, yeah. So anyways, I would just say, think about those things where you have, uh, a unique set of skills or unique knowledge and something that you're interested in and that you can figure out how, you know, what, what about that knowledge or that experience that you can, um, leverage into a business. And it might be a service, service service-based business, or it could be, uh, more of a product-based business. Well, you're in sort of a unique category. So my wife's a chef and she would work long hours in the kitchen. She'd come home. And she'd be excited about cooking something or excited about, uh, uh, dry aging her own, uh, Westphalia ham or, or whatever it might be. And most people who work, it's like the mechanic that's got the crummy car because they never want to touch their own vehicle just enough to get it there and back from work because they're working on it all day. You're in a position where you've taken your passion, you've taken something that you love and you kind of made it your work. Do you find that it's, do you find that difficult? Like, does it take yeah. some of the joy out of your work when you're, okay, now I'm, I know I'm out there, but I'm field testing one of my pieces of equipment or does that oh, get difficult? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, my general operating assumption is that the minute this business or my, my work 
stop, ceases to be fun, I'm going to walk away from it. And mm. I think about that frequently and I say no to things that I don't think are fun or keeping this interesting for me. And I try very hard to, and I work very hard to create uh, a business that is interesting to me and doesn't make me hate hunting and hunting gear. Um, mm. Cause it's right. It's, it's a uh, making your passion, your job is not always the best thing. Um, it's not the best, it's not the right thing to do necessarily either. Right. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of like, there's a reason I don't, I never, I've never become a guide, I've never official like, been a big game hunting guide and it's because i know it would ruin hunting for me uh and it (laughs) a lot of respect goes out there to the guides like i just i think i would have some great clients that i enjoyed hanging out with but i would have there would be some people that i'm like man this is not fun i don't want to do this anymore and that would make me you know and so for me one of the ways i keep it fun is i carve out a lot of time to go hunting so hunting i i have made i make a commitment every year to, to hunt as much as I possibly can. I don't know how long I'm going to be alive on this planet. So, um, I didn't start this business to not continue to hunt or to keep doing fun adventures. And so I take large chunks of time and I go hunting. Um, and when I'm out hunting, it's, it is definitely, uh, it's a lot of work because usually we're filming content, right? So we might Mm -hmm. be going on a hunt, but there's cameras around. I might be self filming. Or we have, you know, one or two people running cameras. And that's, um, it's not, uh, it, it definitely changes the hunt when that, when that's what's going, when you have cameras around. Yes. Um, there are times where I have been very frustrated by the cameras and I've just said like, I, I'm over this. Like, I don't, I don't want to do this. Any, like, this is not fun. Like, I just mm-hmm. want to go hunt like the way I used to uh, by myself or with my family, my friends, not mm-hmm. to worry about this, but. You know, that's a, um, it, it's almost like a spoiled kid crying that he has too much money or something, you know, like, <laughs> sure. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like you have created I get a, it though. Yeah. I, I mean, I get it, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, like you've created a business where you get to go on all these like fun trips and like, you know, if anybody else look from the outside, they like cry me a river. Um, right. you know, that's, it's. This is, <laughs> you've created this world, like now live in it. Um, yeah. So it's a, to me, it's a small uh, penance to pay. And I, I usually, uh, the way I try and balance that is I'll do, you know, one or two uh, hunts a year with no cameras around, just, just me and uh, either by myself or with buddies and just like, it's just me hunting for me. Um, and that keeps me uh, centered. I'd say I haven't, um, I, I actually really love making products and I mm-hmm. love testing gear and I haven't gotten tired of that yet. I might get tired of it someday. I reserve the right to hate it at some point. I haven't reached that point yet. I still love it. I think about it. It's, it's the last thing I think about when I go to bed. Typically it is the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, I think about really? fabrics. It is. It's, and I love it. I, I am, uh, I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> It is good. For, I mean, it, there's a reason I'm doing what I'm doing, right? It's like totally. And I think that when when you're making a product, there is no detail that is insignificant. Not one, down to the the size of the thread, uh, this you know the the elasticity of the thread. There is nothing mm-hmm. that I consider to be insignificant on a product. Nothing, and that drives people around me probably crazy. Um, but it is I. But you know what, like. That's, you know, I feel like that's what sets our products apart is like, I don't, I'm not satisfied with that. And if I don't like it, we won't make it. Um, and if Absolutely. I have, I have spent, I have been in a room with one of our engineers and we're looking at 3D printouts of our knives. And I mean, it, there was, there was a knife design, our Serac knife. I can't tell you how many editions of our Serac we went through where we were, we were printing off 3D prints, just trying to get the shape right, first of all. Mm. And I had... The way our design pro- I'm not an engineer, so like, you know, I, I rely on people that have a lot more skill and talent than I do to actually bring these products to, to life. And, but I drew it, I draw them out like to a T of what I want exactly. And I'm like, okay, this is what I, this is the shape, the size, dimensions, everything. Like, this is what I want. You know, it's just get into a CAD file and get some 3D printouts. And it was off like probably about a millimeter. 
And I was looking at it and I'm like, this is, this is wrong. This is like, can you see how like this little part of it, it's like got about a half a millimeter more. <laughs> and he's like, I can't see that. And I'm like, it's there. And you know, like that's the kind of like neurosis, neuroses that goes into like product design and development. But I, I love that stuff. And so it's what, it's what keeps me going. Um, and I really do enjoy that process. Well, you can really tell that you've thought these things through because even you, you look at the products that you're, you're designing, even like the game bags and you, you're going through, well, you can use a drawstring string for this. You can actually use it as a pillow. We set it up like this so you can use it as a stuff sack. And it's every little bit of it has, if, if you need emergency shoelaces, here you go. Right you've thought that through and, and you've got another one that, uh, I got to get my name on the pre-order list here somehow, but you've got a belt you've designed. I'll, I'll get your, I'll get you on the pre-order. Yeah. The Kodiak <laughs> belt. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about that. That's it's pretty funny. Cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you about it, man. And I, I should tell you, like, I'm not in the, like the survival wilderness skills community, but the yeah. number of people from that community who have reached out to me be like, Hey, can I get one of those things? Um, I'm like, I, I don't have any to give you right now, but, um, uh, so our Kodiak belt, it is a field belt and a knife sharpener in one. Um, mm -hmm. So it is a, um, I wanted it to be like, you know, a, the ideal belt that I would want to wear, wear uh, for hunting and for just everyday use. And so just thinking about um, how it fits underneath the backpack, um, the, the weight of it, the shape of the buckle, everything like, you know, I wanted it to just be that ideal buckle that just happened to be made out of materials that could shape sharpen or hone any knife broadhead or anything any fishing hook anything else you want to keep sharp um the uh, speaking of product design and being anal retentive the, <laughs> this product <laughs> took me yeah like two years of like concerted effort and just trial and error and at one point uh walking away for six uh oh, close to six months thinking it was just never gonna work um really oh my gosh yeah man because I couldn't figure out. So if you haven't seen the product, you have to go check it out on our website. It is, it is a, I mean, I'm biased, but it is, a, it's a cool product. It is a cool. It's product. pretty cool. I agree with yeah. you. <laughs> it's, it has three different materials built into the belt. So um, think about just materials that are integrated into the belt that can, that can fully shape it, sharpen your knife. Um, there is a, a six inch vegetable tan leather strop that is sewn into the webbing of the belt on the side. There is a tungsten carbide bar that is that is seated in the top of the of a the the buckle itself is a thin sheet of aluminum and on the top of that on one of the uh, uh top sides we have a, a thin a thin piece of uh tungsten carbide and then on the back what i said what i call the coup de gras of the belt on the back of the buckle is a flush piece of uh 800 grit diamond grit so you so can cool. yeah so that that diamond grit piece of it that took forever to figure out how to make that the tungsten carbide. I mean, tungsten carbide is not a common knife sharpening material. Um, mm. I, I just happened to have a, a good friend of mine who I went to uh, high school with, who is a PhD material scientist. And I'd stop by his office and I'd say, you know, he doesn't know anything about knife sharpening. He's like in like, you know, material science. He's mostly doing like high tech, you know, computer processing, you know, microchips and, but he knows a little bit about everything. And I'd stop by his office and I, his name is Brian. I'd be like, Brian, here's what I'm trying to make. I, I don't really know, you know, like here's the common materials for knife sharpening. And, and he's like, Hey, you ever thought about tungsten carbide? And I was like, no, I haven't. I don't really know a whole lot about tungsten carbide. <laughs> and then right I started, on Brian. yeah. So Brian had no, and so I started testing it and I was like, this stuff actually works, you know, to sharpen a knife. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also really expensive. It's tungsten carbide is used to for like drill bits to like drill in, you know, rare minerals and like yeah. um, it's used on the bottom of trekking poles as well. Yeah. Um, but the first, the, so the first belt we made, um, complete belt, the, the price, like our price for it was about $300 a belt. Like that was how much <laughs> it was going to cost for us to make individual units, let alone sell it at a price, right. at a profit. And I was like, there is no way. Where no one's gonna pay, you know, whatever, 400, 500 bucks for a a, a belt buckle. It doesn't matter what it does. Be a um, limited it has market. Like a, yeah, it has a blowtorch that like comes out of it or something and can like start a fire <laughs> or like. Um, so, Do anyways, taxes for you. Yeah, exactly. So, just figuring out how to like get the the manufacturing uh, 
right and getting getting a process down with our manufacturer that that actually made it at a price that people would be willing to pay it took a long time and then just getting the materials right and the design right um yeah it just took a, a long time and then and then the thing the other thing that uh, you'll people will see if they look at it the way the webbing capture system works it creates a really flush uh flush system against your stomach uh, which I really wanted because anybody who's ever packed out, had a heavy pack on knows that when you cinch down your hip belt, if you have like a, a traditional webbing belt, it creates a little bulge right around your stomach mm. and your hip belt, which is you have to either push that bulge above or below your hip belt or it digs into your stomach. And so it's really uncomfortable. Um, the way our webbing capture system works, it creates a really flat surface that mirrors the shape of your belt buckle on your backpack. And so it creates a flat plate essentially which is really comfortable way um, to uh, to wear a belt buckle. So, anyways, I this belt has been it. You know, it's only on pre-sale right now. We started a pre-sale a few months back. It doesn't actually, it won't actually be for sale um, probably until at least late October. Um, sure. And you know, so far it's it's been a very very popular item for us. Um, uh, but I will I will get you on the the pre-sale list there. Absolutely, so. <laughs> please. So you brought up a bunch of things and I should be taking notes because my ADHD mind will just jump all over the place, but, uh, you're, you're talking about, um, we've talked about filming. I really want to touch on that. So if we don't yeah. remind me, okay. um, as well, heavy packs. Now you've got a climbing background. Are you, are you familiar with Mark Twight? Oh, uh, to okay. kiss or kills is one of my all time. I read that thing about once a year. Okay. So in listening to you talk and, and watching you, I'm like, you know, I, I'm sure there's some Mark Twight philosophy that's kind of rubbed off here a little bit, because I definitely see that you, you go fast, you go hard, but you'll, uh, and, and lightweight. Um, is that a, would that be a correct oh, assessment? I, I, I think, you know, I actually, the first article I ever wrote for our field notes was, uh, it was based on Mark Twight's philosophy of, of light and fast. Um, so that's funny. It's funny to hear you talk about Mark Twight. It sounds like you're a fan as well. Um, I don't I actually am, know yes. Mark personally, but um, I think he his his way of approaching the mountains is how I approach my life. Um, I agree. Yes. Is that does that make sense? Is that you try? So yeah. if you're not familiar with Mark Twight, his book To Kiss or Kill, everybody should read that book. It's mm -hmm. about it's a series of essays that are about his climbing adventures. Um, they're phenomenal stories in general, but there's a lot to be learned about, uh, there's a lot to be learned in period, period from Mark Twight's book. And I think one of the things that, that Mark really pioneered, you know, it used to be that, you know, mountaineers went, uh, when, when they would want to climb a big mountain, it was like siege tactics, like lots of guys, lots of gear, you'd shuttle gear, you just essentially staged gear up the mountain, food, water, mm -hmm. tent, supplies. And it was just like a siege tactics. Like it took forever, but eventually you get to the top, stack enough people, enough hours, enough ropes. Eventually you're going to get to the top of the mountain. And here comes Mark Twight and I think some other con his contemporaries taking nothing, like no gear, no right. shelter, going, you know, solo climbing a lot of the time. Uh, but just really this idea that once you shed yourself of all your weight, you can go so much faster and cover so much more ground and do so much more. And it was revolutionary at the time. It totally was a revolutionary right. tactic. Um, I, I apply that same mentality to my hunting. Um, the less you take, the more that, you know, the more you can do, um, things slow you down. Mm -hmm. Everything slows you down. Weight slows you down. There's a balance to be had there, but that philosophy of like the more you carry, the more weight you have, um, the more it just slows you down. And, uh, there's definitely a, a lot of, I get a lot of pushback for that from guys who are like, ah, it's, you, you're, you know, blowing this out of proportion, you know, there's, you know, and I, I, I may take it to a little bit of an extreme, but you know, my experience has shown me that every ounce, it really does add up and it affects mm -hmm. your mental attitude. It affects your physical abilities. It affect it can affect everything. So I, I carry that through also to our business life, my personal life. It's the, you know, it, yeah, less is more sort of mentality. Well, totally. Well, and he, well, Mark made the very, uh, astute observation. He says, you know, people are getting injured or dying in the mountains because of the length of time they're out there and the amount of exposure. You're getting more tired, you're getting mentally fatigued, your body 
isn't working the way it would. And he said, let's, let's try taking this differently. Let's go fast. Let's go light. Let's go hard. And it's funny, a friend of mine, he's, um, uh, ex British army. He's been on this podcast talking about his, uh, the selection process for SAS and his, his time doing that. And he says, you know, reading Mark Twight's book, um, and he, he's got a couple of, he says the training program that he puts forth in, uh, in this book is very, very similar to the training program that they use for elite special forces, like in the British military. And, uh, that the mentality of being able to accomplish a mission, um, in a very effective way. Mind you, Mark would put the caveat out there with the go fast, go light. You also have to be able to exercise proper judgment and turn around. That mountain will always be there. Turn around if conditions aren't looking favorable, come back again and try fast and hard the next day. Um, as opposed to just slogging through, cause that's where people find themselves in, in trouble. Yeah, no. And I, I think those are words to, words to live by, you know, it's like it, that, yeah, I, I, I do, I think there is a certain amount of, of, uh, mental and physical tenacity that Mark and other, uh, people that I've known that are like him that mm-hmm. I have applied to, you know, my life in many different ways. There's a lot from climbing that I've learned about myself and that I apply to business life and to hunting as well. Um, you know, how to deal with fear is mm-hmm. a big one not letting fear control you getting out of your comfort zone and, and, you know, knowing when you're actually in danger versus when you, your mind is convincing you that you're in danger and you're just scared. You might be scared, but you're safe. Um, right. That's what, uh, and I don't, I don't know if that's been true for you in, in your climbing, but like I, yeah. I, you know, I can distinctly before kids, I can, I could, I did a lot of things that, you know, people close around me don't really know about and I don't really care to tell them about. My wife doesn't mm. ask me a lot of questions about things that <laughs> I used to do. I got lucky. Sure. Um, I've, I've been very lucky. I've had some situations that probably could have gone like a lot worse. Uh, they could have gone worse than they did because uh, nothing ever happened. But um, after kids, uh, I told myself like, I'm not going to dial it back. Um, I've definitely dialed it back <laughs> and I think it's the right call. Um, but there's, there are, I still like getting out and, uh, not scaring myself, but I like getting out and just dealing with that, you know, fear of, of, uh, of being in the mountains and going fast and trying hard things. You and have to do that. You, you got to do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I do anyway. Um, uh, yeah. And like, as an example, there's still another buddy of mine who's a, just an absolute crusher climber. Um, he and I uh, are trying to do this thing, and the, there's this route. Called, there's this piece of rock in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho called the Elephant's Perch. It's this mm-hmm. granite dome, 1,200 foot granite dome. It's some of the best rock in in Lower 48. Like it is absolutely perfect granite, impeccable granite. And uh, we have set out this goal of doing like uh, three of the harder routes there in a day, which has never been done before. But it's all for me. That's like a way I can push myself and do new things that is very physically and mentally difficult. That's never been done, but I also have done those routes before. And so I feel very like safe and confident that even though there mm-hmm. is some like hard rock climbing on those, like it's not a life or death situation for me. And so it's a way for me to like push my, my limits, but in a way that is uh, a little bit more controlled than like in a dad friendly kind of way. Yeah. Well, nothing brings one's own mortality to the forefront than having children. It, it, <laughs> yes. it, I found anyways, it really, yes. all of a sudden a light went on. Pre-children, I wouldn't say I didn't care if I lived or died. Obviously I'd prefer to be alive than to be dead, but I never truly feel, I never truly felt alive or as alive as when I almost died. And I would find myself putting myself into situations which scared me or which were, um, actually potentially quite dangerous for the feeling that you get afterwards of, yes, I've accomplished something. I've pushed myself through, I've gone further and, and you know, I'm not dead and I'm actually capable of a heck of a lot more. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, and I, I still love that. Uh, yeah, you just, it's, it's a personal growth, you know, um, mm-hmm. learning about yourself. What is that? What's the, um, what's the famous quote about, you know, the problem with riding the edge is, um, 
but about like w- once you find it, you're it's too late or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. It's like yeah. Uli. Yes. Ex- yes. Exactly. Um, so. Yeah. Anyways, but yeah, Mark. Just coming back to Mark, like somebody who, uh, you know, certainly is is uh, tougher than shit as an individual. Um, mm-hmm. You know, his whole like I don't know if you aware of like the Jim Jones and yes. how he trained all the guys for that movie. Was it? 300, 300. Yeah, yeah, Superman yeah. and named it after the Jonestown massacre, which is a little tongue in cheek thing, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was definitely like a punk rock guy. Right. Um, yeah. uh, but, uh, yeah, anyways, there's, there's, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot to be learned from Mark. And I feel like, you know, a lot of, you know, hunting without getting too bro I feel like hun- hunting and backcountry hunting has gotten a little bro in some ways. And I, uh-huh. I don't really necessarily like that about it, but I agree. There, there is a physical element that I really enjoy about uh, about pushing my limits just in hunting. You know, so mm-hmm. if we're gonna do a late season hunt in, you know, for us, you know, late season, it might be mid November, and it's down, you know, zero degrees Fahrenheit to you know thirty degrees, um, and you're off, you know, doing a 15, 15 mile, you know, in the mountain trek, um, and it's difficult, and you know that's there is some satisfaction that comes with like accomplishing something like that. And I enjoy that part of it and not, Mm -hmm. not in a, not in a sense that I really care what other people think about it. It's a personal thing. It's very, very Mm -hmm. personal. And, uh, and I think that, you know, so there is, there is some, something like some comparable element to climbing as there is to hunting. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you mentioned something when we were talking earlier about introverts and extroverts and, you said that, uh, you know, a lot of content creators, uh, you've been finding the ones that you've been dealing with or in your opinion are probably more introverted than extroverted. I think we can all be both, I think, but did, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. I, uh, I, I would say that I'm, I am an introvert in that, you know, and if I'm defining that is I don't, I think that extroverts tend to get energized by being around groups of people. Introverts tend to, uh, uh, have their energy systems like taken away <laughs> or right. reduced. I like that. I like that yeah. analogy. And for me, while I enjoy being in social, so, social settings, it is draining for me. It is, it is highly draining and I can only do so yeah. much of it at any one given time. Um, and most of the other content creators that I know are the same way. Um, mm-hmm. which honestly kind of surprised me. You would think that people that, uh, are in front of cameras all the time would be extroverts and, life of the party type personalities like gregarious mm-hmm. and, and certainly some of them are. Um, but, uh, I think people would be surprised what people are, how, how many introverts there are in the content space. Um, you know, and I'm speaking to the, to the hunting world in particular, just people that mm-hmm. I know, um, that I've been around and I, I don't know why that is. I really don't, but I find it really fascinating. There's something, there's something that's very like intimate when I'm out just self filming Um, it it feels like I'm just talking to a friend when I have the camera with me. Like it doesn't feel Mm -hmm. like I'm talking to thousands of, you know, strangers on YouTube. Um, and, uh, so it doesn't feel as though I'm being social when I'm doing that. But, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, anyways, interesting. I don't know what it is, but there are definitely a lot of introverts out there in creating content. Yeah, I agree. I'd, I would classify myself in the introvert category based on that description of being around people draining your energy. Cause it definitely doesn't fill me up and it's work, it's effort. And I crave the mountains or I crave the outdoors. And when I'm out there, that's when I'm at my best. Um, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yep. So, you know, there's a lot of people will look at some of the media that's out there. They'll look at the content that you're putting out and they'll want to do something similar, even if it's just for their family and friends, or maybe they want to film something, uh, at a larger scale. If you were to, uh, take out and self film your own, just to self film yourself, what would be essential equipment? What would you want to bring without going too heavy? And sticking with the whole Mark Twight philosophy. Um, man, that's, that is, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I'll tell you what I bring. Usually I have at least like a, a high end, like camcorder that okay. I use, um, as my primary camera. And then I'll have, uh, at least two, usually two other cameras, like a point of view camera 
and then a little we have this little uh, uh, camera that I use for like motion shots, and that works out pretty well for me. Um, I'd say that you know you can we get a lot of questions about camera equipment, and you can mm. you can go really fancy. I mean, when we go out with a film crew, we have a lot fancier equipment that we use camera equipment, but mm. you don't you don't need fancy equipment to tell a good story. You can just I mean you could even use a GoPro. The mm. uh, the thing that most people I think overemphasize is equipment and they undervalue story and right yeah and the the reason people if you were to ask like why you know just somebody out there like why do you like this person like why do you like steven ranella why do you like meat eater it's because they like steve right mm-hmm. they like steve and yeah the, the the cinematography and the music and the editing is like it's it's good right like, i'm not saying it's bad but it's the sure. personalities of the the people you're watching that you're drawn to. Um, so yeah, focus on the story, focus on making it personable, making it interesting and making it unique. Um, and, uh, I'd say, you know, don't try and copy somebody else necessarily try and figure out like what your voice is. And that takes a lot of trial and error. I actually, Mm. (laughs) before we even started filming years, years prior, I had taken a little tiny camera out and tried to self film. And I just remember it felt so awkward and, and it was just garbage, man. I just remember going back and looking at my video clips <laughs> thinking, you're, this is awful. Like, you're never going to, you're never going to do this. Like, if there's one thing I can guarantee you'll never do. It's make hunting content. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a whole ton of them out now, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's definitely, I was wrong about that. So. Yeah. And they're fantastic. Are you, are you doing any of the editing yourself or do you have other people helping with that? So, uh, we do it all in house. My, my business partner, Jason does all that. So the guy that I had the beer with, um, he's, he actually self filmed and is in some content. Now he's always been behind the camera, but we've been pushing him to get out in front of the camera. He's a great guy. Nice. Um, and so he does all of our, uh, all of our editing. We, we do it. We used to do a lot of it together. Um, but now we've kind of, as we've gotten busier and bigger, we've kind of just distributed the, the roles and responsibilities a lot. So, he does pretty much everything on the editing side now, and I will join him in the editing bay um, occasionally, mm-hmm. but it's pretty much all him. Well, I mean, it's really, when I mean, you're talking about the stop motion, you're watching like the, uh, the stars going overhead or motion graphics tracing over top of the ridge line. Like there's a lot of work that's gone into these videos that, uh, that you guys are making. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and when we do motion graphics, I've, you know, uh, a friend of mine uh, named Conrad, he's a really talented motion graphics guy. So we, we, we definitely pull in for our bigger film pieces. We, we try and make them uh, visually appealing and have a cinematic element to mm-hmm. them as well. Um, and, and some of that too is to make them appealing to people that aren't into hunting. And I think that's, I think yeah. that's a huge point right there. Yeah. I think, I think you're really, uh, you're broadening the horizon of what hunting is to, to people who otherwise are used to the old grip and grin type type shows. And you might be introducing a whole new generation of people who wouldn't otherwise want, want to be interested in hunting. I, I think that's a really smart thing that you guys are doing. Oh yeah. Thank you. We, we try and some, <laughs> certainly some of the more, some of the, the most like valued feedback that I've received is from people that do not hunt but they have watched like our, our film about the Frank church wilderness mm-hmm. the last wild places series by the Frank. And they're like, man, that was a cool adventure. I don't even hunt, but that sounds like something I might be interested in doing or thanks for sharing that, that trip. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really cool. And then audio, like we talked about the video audio is obviously very important. Um, <laughs> are you bringing separate microphones or are you just using on camera mics or, we use, I use an onboard mic. Uh, so, so when I'm self filming, I have an onboard mic, um, that sits on my camera. And, uh, sometimes we will use separate, um, if we have like for bringing in other people. Yes. We'll bring in, um, separate mics as well and mic up mm-hmm. occasionally for interviews, but it's a pain to bring in, you know, to always be wearing a mic and it's just not realistic. So shotgun mics are pretty standard for us. Yeah. Like a little road pro plus or something or yeah, something smaller. Exactly. Yep. Um, it depends yeah. on the camera. We have a few different cameras. So depending on which, which one we have kind of different, different mics that can go on those cameras. So we will bring in, you know, mics to capture audio. There, have, there have been, you know, capturing good audio is, is 
also something I, I didn't appreciate. And I don't think a lot of like new content creators really appreciate that audio can really is, is a backbone of a content piece. Mm -hmm. And so spending the time to get that audio is really important. I, that I was think, something that stood yeah. out to me watching your stuff. That, that, that audio work is something you guys obviously spend a lot of attention to. A ton, a ton. Yeah. yeah. And we've, we have gotten back home sometimes and been like, man, the audio from, you know, this day and this day and this day is garbage. Like there was, the wind was, the wind noise was too much or like, and that's a bummer because <laughs> when you spend all that time and your audio is garbage because it, it leaves some holes in your, in your uh, story or your editing, you have to get creative. But, um, yeah, and that's, again, that's not something I understood when we got into this. You know, my, my business partner, I'm, I'm fortunate to have him because he, um, he understands sort of the technical storytelling side of the, the film world. I think we're a good balance in terms of knowing what, uh, what the story we want to tell and working together to sort of weave that together. Um, mm. But his, his, I would say, technical and cinematic uh, experience and knowledge is far, far and above mine. Well, I don't think you guys are necessarily monetizing the, um, uh, this show, are you? Like, you know, we, we, it's funny you mentioned, asked that we, we, we do some and not on others. I mean, here's another, you want, you want real talk yeah. monetization on YouTube. Anybody who thinks you're going to go out and just make a bunch of money on ads on YouTube, like not going to happen unless, right. unless, and until you hit that, like, 200 300 million subscriber mark then you mm -hmm. can start making some money on totally. on youtube uh and you're getting like millions of views and you're creating lots of videos you know making a dozen two dozen even three dozen videos and expecting those are going to make you a lot of money like this is not going to happen the youtube's ad revenue system is not set up as an ecosystem for that to be a significant amount of money totally so well, what, what I think it's really clever at though, is it like, it'll highlight your kit and it'll highlight your stuff and it'll be shown it being used in a real environment in a real way. And uh, from a marketing perspective, although it's not directly monetized, I think that's a, um, a very, very smart approach that you've taken, not only educating people and entertaining people, but it's also serves as a marketing piece as yeah. well. Well, I mean, to me, like. Brands are a very interesting thing. Like, what is a brand? What is a brand that, you know, you're wearing an Under Armour shirt right now, right? right. Um, and I'm not saying that you're in love with Under Armour, but Under Armour has a really interesting brand story. And we are, we are all, all of us are, are, none of us are impervious to being drawn to brands because there's something about them that, that we identify with or that we like in some way we may not be able to articulate it we may not even understand it but brands speak to us and good brands who tell a story about what who they are and their values and what they represent those are the ones that i like personally right if totally. we just if we didn't have an interesting uh brand and i i think we we, we try very hard to have a unique voice and have a unique brand we're just a company that made some game bags and some knives and had nothing else interesting to say or didn't have anything else. There was no backbone behind that. I don't feel we would have made inroads the way we, we, we have so far. Um, mm. And it, I don't view that as um, duplicitous or we're trying to trick anybody, but our content is a way for us to share who we are and help people understand and relate to us as a brand. Right? So it's a way for us to connect with people. And that's, one of the wonderful things about YouTube, it is it is the great leveler, right? You don't have to buy ad space or buy a TV show to like tell people who you are. The internet mm -hmm. exists, YouTube exists. It is yours to use to communicate to your your audience however you see fit. Um, and so for for us, yes, content is we enjoy doing it, and there is oftentimes uh, uh, there are multiple reasons why we might do it. But paramount amongst those is trying to communicate uh, who we are and what we value and what's important to us. That's fantastic. It's yeah. The people will purchase not necessarily what the product is, but why the product is. And I think Simon Sinek did a neat little talk on that. That kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen that Ted talk he did. 
No, uh, I talk. Know. Uh, it's an interesting one. Um, to check it out. Yeah, actually, it, because it basically uh, spoke in a much more eloquent way than I'm sure I will. But it, it speaks to why people are drawn to different things. And, and you essentially just put that whole idea into a nutshell there. People will... <laughs> People will get behind a brand because they believe in what it is. People buy Apple computers, not because it's got a great monitor and a great processor or whatever it is. There's going to be other computers that have better, have better screens and, and better, more memory, but they're buying into an ecosystem and they're buying into a culture. They're buying into, um, whatever Apple's motto is, think differently or, um, yeah. yeah, their motto, their motto isn't, we make great computers or we make a cool phone, right? It's like, yeah, right. think differently or whatever it is. Like it's right. Yeah. Think differently. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, in, yeah, no, I, anyway, yeah. I, and I think hit the about nail that, on the head there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, again, I, I feel like it's the, you know, Patagonia, a brand like love it or hate it. Mm. That is a, that is a brand that is recognizable and has a very loyal, hardcore set of customers. Right. And mm -hmm. because they have, they have stayed true to who they are and what they believe. Um, and it's more than just a clothing company, right? Nobody thinks mm -hmm. that Patagonia is just a clothing company. I don't anyway. No. I don't want us to just be a gear company, right? Like I want us to be much more than that, an idea. I want people to, our customers, there, there are a lot of our customers who are probably just buying our product because they like the product and that's fine. Sure. But when I think about like, what do I want our customers to think of when they're, opening up a set of game bags. I don't want them to think about like, this is a throwaway product. I want them to think about like, this represents adventure. This represents food, meat, like all the things that I care about. It is a, it is a, um, an idea. It's a metaphor. It's not just a set of game bags. And I want them to, you know, sort of understand that like all the reasons that we created a product that traditionally was a throwaway product, it's, it's, you know, it is purpose built for people that are trying to um, go out and find their own adventure, whatever that looks like. And so sounds very simple. I, you know, I'm not saying we have it figured out, but that is what we, how I think about branding and, and marketing and just mm. like the way we, why, why do we do, why do we create content? Um, uh, and how do we tell our story as a company? Well, you're doing a fantastic job with it. <laughs> well, it thank it, you. If we were to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about gear. Yeah. You're going out on a mountain hunt. You're going light. You're going fast. Um, I'm sure there's times you've gotten up there and you've regretted not bringing certain things because you'd be a heck of a lot more comfortable. But what would be some, uh, you going on a multi-day hunt. What are, what are some necessities that you just can't live without? Uh, good question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that has spreadsheets for each hunt I go on. So like archery meal deer, archery elk. Um, uh, I, I, so yeah, so I'm packing pretty, pretty light. Um, you know, the basics of like good backpack, good boots are, I'd say like pretty, those are like the, and my like hierarchy of gear needs, like boots are right at the top. Mm. Um, I don't always take a tent, um, but usually take a sleeping bag and a pad to sleep on because sleep, getting a decent amount of sleep is really important for my like mm -hmm. performance and my ability to think clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, you know, I, I usually take a stove for food. Not always. Sometimes I'll just eat cold, cold meals or take meals that don't require hot water. Um, I rarely leave without coffee because I'm addicted to caffeine. Um, <laughs> so for all yeah. the lightweight <laughs> lightweight talk that I do. Um, I, I usually don't leave home without some, some, uh, some little coffee packets. Um, yeah. so yeah, boots, bag, uh, just normal stuff, man. Normal backpacking gear, nothing, nothing fancy. I don't take a Leatherman. I don't take a multi-tool. Um, I try not to take anything that doesn't have, uh, at least a couple of uses. It's not mm. always uh, doable, but I just try and make do with, uh, as little as I can and still be like comfortable. So I don't like going hungry. That's the other thing is like, I don't like starving out there. And mm. I, um, I'm not, I'm not a particularly, I'm, I'm what six, two, 180, uh, fairly like thin dude, but like I eat like, I'm 
a lot bigger than that. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, I, I'd probably take sometimes a little more food than I need to, but uh, depending on the length of the hunt, I'm okay carrying an extra half a pound of food. If that means I'm not sitting up there wishing I had more. Um, and then I, you know, I rarely, uh, most mountain hunts, I pretty much always take a tripod usually cause I'm filming, but mm-hmm. also because I, I always, uh, especially for like deer hunting, uh, but pretty much for every, t- every kind of hunting, I, I prefer to glass with my binoculars on my tripod as much as I can. And I, I just, you just catch so much more game that way. Deer, mm-hmm. elk, you know, whatever sheep, goats, like bedded down that you might not see otherwise. So, um, I carry a few items that I consider sort of important hunting items like that, um, that you could probably, some people might say you could do without, but I think it's pretty important. You bring in a spotting scope as well, or just using the binos for all your work? Spotting scope if I'm hunting mule deer, for sure. Hmm. Um, I don't, you know, elk, elk are, are kind of big and easy to see. And I can, uh, I'm not, I'm not much of a trophy hunter when it comes to elk. I like shooting big elk. Um, but I am for deer, I tend to trophy hunt. And mm. so I like to know what I'm looking at before I uh, dive in after it. So spotting scope for deer, um, and it depends on the trip. So sometimes I'll take a spotting scope. Sometimes I'll just take a bigger set of binoculars. So last year we did like a, a backpack hunt that was, you know, I don't know, 11 miles and 5,000 vertical feet to get to our high camp. So I was really thinking pretty hard about my gear choices. Mm-hmm. Um, took a hot tent, so I had a collapsible titanium stove, but I didn't take a canister fuel stove. I just took a, a titanium cup to heat up my mm-hmm. water on. Um, so, so made some sacrifices there. I also didn't take a spotting scope. Wish I would have, um, but ended up what taking. Were, what it. were we hunting on that one? Uh, mule deer. Mule deer on that one. Okay. Yep. Uh, rutting mule deer in that one, and uh, you know, there's. Uh, I ended up shooting a, like getting a nice buck, but there were a couple of deer like off the distance. that was like really nice frame bucks. Uh, but it was, they were far enough away where it's like, I'm not going to go after that unless if it's like a giant two point and I just couldn't tell through my binos kind of what I was dealing with. Right. Um, so yeah, anyways, sometimes I take a spotter and some at that particular trip, I just decided I'm like, it's not, I, I can deal with uh 12 X binos on a tripod mm. and leave the spotter at home. And, I wish I had had a spotter, but I didn't regret it when we were hiking in because that was, it was hellacious. <laughs> right. So, totally. Yeah. Um, I love it. Is there anything else that we should be talking about? Is there anything that we've uh, kind of left out here? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Nothing about me. I mean, at some point I'd love to learn more about you and, uh, at some point I need to, yeah, pick your brain about hunting in Canada because it's, it's on my list and I've never done it, but never been, we can do that uh, another time. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think maybe we should have another podcast and we can I talk about hunting. I think that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as soon as we open up these borders here and we can have some free travel back and forth and, uh, have you up here and we'll do some hunting. Yeah. I heard you guys might be opening up your borders. Did I, did I see that correctly? Yeah. Would they say fully vaccinated individuals can come on in something like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. anyways, yeah, it's on uh, Canada's. I love. I'm a huge fan of Canada, and I uh, would love to get up there and do some hunting at some point. Especially, you guys have giant mule deer, and as a deer junkie, I'm I've got my eyeball on that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. There's, there's actually a f- number of other things that I'd love to chat about, but I've taken a lot of your time, and you've got your family there, and I don't want to take up too much more. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll look at doing a part two on another, another day, but thank you very much, uh, for being on the silver core podcast, Brad. I really appreciate it. I, I've really enjoyed the conversation, Travis, and, uh, honored to be on it. And I appreciate you having me on. 